of it. <laughs> All of it. <laughs> Our guest is Secretary Madeleine Albright, Brian Cranston, Tank and the Bangas, Barry Jenkins, Celia King and Bulger, Aaron Lee Carr, Esperanza Spalding, Gideon Glick, Helen Yoyemi, Fab Five Freddy, Danga Akanabe, Brene Brown, Tony Goldwyn, Tammy Newton, Jake Jill <laughs> Welcome to all of it. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello. What a pleasure. Hi. Hi. This is so fun. I'll see you tomorrow. We're here every day, 12 to 2. The impromptu concert. I love it. I love it. I was there for the love of it. You must tell the truth. I'm sure everyone's perspective is unique. There's a lot of truth about the pain of being an immigrant, mm. but they're jokes. We find the funny. It's our strength. At what point do you think women's health care will stop being a political issue? When half of Congress can get pregnant. Ran out of words, but we do what we do. We mm. don't have no words, so we got to trade twos. So we trade twos, all this really dope groove. And Allison was so nice to meet you. Welcome to our Get Lit with All of It May event with Aaron and Diaz. I'm Allison Stewart. Thank you so much for joining us. We have our event, it's kind of new for us. This is a hybrid. We've never done this before. It's the first time we're in real life. Hernan's right there, he's right there. Um, but we don't have an audience because of the rising COVID cases in the city. We thought it was better to have a really fun, safe event. So you, our audience, are virtual in your sweatpants. Go you, get a glass of wine, settle in. We're gonna have a great evening. Not only is Hernan Diaz here to discuss trust, also Shana Taub will be with us. Her off-Broadway show, huge hit, Suffs. Just rap. She also has a new album out. She'll be performing a couple of songs from that as well. Uh, also want to let you know that you get to ask questions of Aaron Diaz as well. You can put your comments and questions in the YouTube chat, or you can head on over to our Instagram at all of it WNYC. Uh, that's what we're gonna do. So let's just get to it. Not only is Aaron Diaz a Pulitzer Prize finalist, he also edits a journal focused on Hispanics and Latinx studies at Columbia University. He is our author, and thanks to our partners at the New York Public Library, 3,364 of you were able to check out a copy of his novel, Trust, to read along with us. And Ernan is live with me in the green space at WNYC. 3,364 wow. people. Wow, I had no idea. That's so great to hear, also because I'm such a fan of the New York Public Library, and a great part of the book was written there. I remember you telling us, yeah. I think we had you on the show for a preview and you were explaining some of the, the research you had to do. That's right, that was on Ron Carter's birthday. Oh, that's right, yes. <laughs> that's right, that's right. No pressure, you get no. to go after Ron Carter, yes. What are some of the things, I remember you telling us early on, some of the things you did, you read about women of this era. Yes. The wives are also a very rich men of this era. What were you looking for and what was something that you learned that you was really useful? Um, weirdly, what I learned that was really useful going through these materials was not in the materials themselves, although there was a wealth of information in there about their um, daily habits, which felt uh, somewhat suffocating. Maybe I'm assigning this to them, but um, some of these details made it into the novel. Uh, uh, there was one particular woman who wrote, at, at home, at home, at home, you know, oh on every, you know, page after page, you you start feeling the sense of oppression. Um, details about their everyday lives. There's lots of lists and inventory, so you get a sense of of the quotidian life. Um, but uh, two things uh, were the were crucial discoveries. The first one was uh, the restricted role to which most of these women had been confined mm. within, within the household, which was a crushing thing to witness firsthand. And the second thing was that so many of these documents hadn't been touched for sometimes a century. So they had been archived and they had remained there, you know, and I would, I would open them and they would, be, they would be crumbly. It was clear that nobody had touched those papers in decades or maybe a century. So to this day, uh, the voices of those women uh, remain unheard to a large extent. Oh, that's so interesting. What did that feel like? It was it was very poignant. It was yeah. it was it was it was very it was very sad. It was very moving, and it really shaped that part of the book a lot. Uh, th there is, I should I should add, uh, for those who haven't read, it, there is there is one such journal in the book, mm -hmm. and 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 my experience of reading the real journals really permeated the writing of that part. You know, I was, I was interviewing 
one of the cast members of the Gilded Age, the one who plays oh. Bertha, uh -huh. Carrie Coons, uh, plays this woman who has this great amount of ambition and she thinks she wants to do, and her husband's this robber baron, yes. and she exerts her power through parties, right. sort of. Yes. And I thought that was interesting, and one thing Carrie said is like, well, what were you going to do if you were a woman? Yes. Who was bright at that time? Right. If you had ambitions, uh, that 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 was that is completely spot on and and real. You can mm -hmm. see that in, in in the historical documents. Uh, you know, uh, there's lots of luncheons in in these in, in these <laughs> in these journals with lists of Vanderbilts and mm -hmm. Van der Rensselaers and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, but yes, lots of lots of parties. Yeah. Let's talk about the structure of the novel. Let's. We got a lot of questions about this right. already. When did the idea for this structure come to you? This idea of a novel, an outline of a memoir, a researched piece of writing, and then a diary. Well, it, it came to me, it's, it's completely related to what we were just talking about. It came to me when I was trying to think about, the, as I said, the, the plays that these women had been assigned uh, in this in this world of extravagant wealth, mm. and uh, for the most part, they were voiceless. As I was just trying to say, and the, to this day, they remain to a large extent. So, um, so the the thought was to enact this voicelessness and to play with the notion of voice and to ask myself, you know, who who has a voice, who's denied one, and and what better way to actually have a polyphonic text, have mm -hmm. all these voices. And, and sometimes, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the speaker is not who you think it is. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you overinvest in one and underestimate another. Uh, so I thought it was a good way to invite readers to, to revise and reassess the assumptions with which we all walk into texts, right? And, and again, I thought this... Uh, this collection of documents was a good way to engage the reader actively in this process. Did you always know you were going to make the first two narratives male and split and have the last two be women, or did you play <clears throat> with that at all? Well, um, this is this is a bit of a spoiler, but I don't I don't know if the second narrative is male. I think I think in the end there's there's only one male narrative. <sighs> yeah. You just blew my mind. Yeah, I mean, we, we can we can assume that everyone I think here every, has. Yes, everybody's read the book. Everyone has read the book. So, okay, so we can we can talk freely. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Wonderful. So, the the idea again, going back to the whole voice issue, was what if I had this was this was the thought okay. that gave the whole book its structure. What if I have this super blustery, self-aggrandizing, male, annoying, jarring voice? But in fact, which is the second book, the okay. unfinished mm -hmm. uh, autobiography, but in fact, this voice had been penned, written by a woman. So it's the, it's the invention of... A, she ghost-wrote the whole thing, Ida. Um, so, I, so that's the expectation of the reader that I was subverting. You confront this voice, which is so jarring and so masculine in the worst possible <laughs> sense, but it's the fabrication of this woman who in real life I, is denied a voice and yet kind of hijacks the voice of, of this enormously wealthy employer. So that, that is the trick there. That's the play. So actually, yeah, except for I the think, first yeah. novel, within the novel, everyone who speaks is, is indeed a woman. Now I have to think about it yeah. entirely differently. You really <laughs> blew my mind. Yeah. Well, the, the book is peppered with these little revelations and 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 how the different four sections interact so it's it's up to the reader to become a, a little bit of a, of a sleuth and and try to find out how things work I do remember when I finished it and I wish that I had, had more time that I thought I will want to re I want to read this again <laughs> because I think this is a different book the second time uh, I hope so I hope so after That's all of the revelations I would want yeah. to go back and see well um, All of those little twists and turns you just made. Th there are a lot, and 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 I, I feel I was hoping. I don't know if it succeeded or to what extent, but I was hoping that it would be a book that can be experienced in in on different planes. 
uh, for instance, the, the big revelation at, at the end of you know who, mm. who is Mildred in this whole story, to some readers won't be a revelation. Perhaps to some of the readers, it was a confirmation of what they had puzzled together along mm -hmm. the way. For others, I know it's a surprise, and so on and so forth. You know, what's the relationship between the novelist in the first part and Mildred mm -hmm. in the fourth part? There are clues in there uh, to that effect as well. Uh, so, yeah. We actually asked, an, our, we hold our, our book club on Instagram in between these, the, but when we first interview an author and then when we have you on again, and we asked if people saw the ending coming. And 78% oh. said no, but 22% said yes. They I love did that see ratio. the ending coming. That's, that's a beautiful spot to be in. Yeah, because you feel that if a quarter, give or mm -hmm. take, of, of, the, of the readership saw it coming, it doesn't feel... I, I don't know about you, but I, I hate like big reveals that come out of <laughs> nowhere. Like it, it was the butler, you know, <laughs> just out of nowhere. Uh, I like to be given all the elements to mm. have an informed kind of guess of what the outcome of the book will be. So th the fact that a quarter of the readers figure it out makes me happy. Yeah. Let's start with the novel, though. <laughs> Let's talk about the novel a little bit. So it's largely fictional, but there are some truths present about Bevel. What were some of the I guess you might be the only one who knows the real truth. <laughs> what are some of the sort of facts of his existence or the facts about his personality that did come out in the novel, that are true in the novel? In, we're talking about the novel within the novel. Novel within the novel, Okay, yes. good. Um, so what, what, are, what are the truths? That in are bonds. In, in bonds, yes. Uh, I think... I think Harold Vanner, who is the fictional author of this novel within the novel, mm -hmm. gets a lot of it right. He gets a lot of it right. I think he gets mostly the relationship between Andrew and Helen right. Uh, and I was very interested in, in exploring that because that is where also Andrew, who is this you know, exceedingly wealthy, uh, seemingly impenetrable you know, mm -hmm. man, that's where his humanity comes out and his relationship with his wife. And he loves her very deeply and admires her and is completely intimidated by her. Mm. And to me, the interesting thing was that she feels no disdain for him. She tries. She does try. But, but she can't. Mm -hmm. So it's this dissymmetry between them that I think um, is the main thing that Vanner gets right. But of course, his, his great sin to to me his great ethical uh, shortcoming uh, is th is that he invents this this uh, madness he he, he breaks her mm. you know in the way I feel that male writers have had a tendency to break uh, women in 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 the history of Western literature you know so that that is a trope that I was interested in mm. in exploring yeah in Mildred's diaries it seems that she was much closer to Vanner. Um, uh, I think so. Yeah, I think. Then perhaps. Then perhaps in the novel. Yes. Yeah, I think again. I think it was a relationship of great camaraderie to some mm -hmm. extent, and they they shared this interest in 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 finance and math and 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 intellectual uh, exploration of that world. The difference is that one of them was widely talented and the other one not so much, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, so that that discrepancy, that disparity that I was alluding to mm -hmm. uh, in, in the fictional version of the facts, I think, also exists in 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 the in the in the in the in the journal. Uh, but it's also it's it's a complicated marriage. They you know they go for years without talking to each other, mm -hmm. for example, and uh, yeah. Uh, I, I I was hoping to to create the notion of of a com complex relationship while providing very few details details about that relationship. That that was partly the excuse me. That was partly the the challenge. We asked our readers whether they thought Bevel really loved Mildred. Yes. Oh, oh, are you asking me back? No, I'm curious. Well, what? Oh, do you have stats? I do. Yes. 50-50. Um, um, no. Yeah. 
Love it. That's <laughs> that's great. That's completely ambiguous. I, I, that's that's amazing. What do you think? <laughs> I think. I think he had strong feelings for her. Yeah. I'm wondering about his capacity to actually love. Ooh, that's very well put. Yeah. That was that. So that's why the word love. Yeah. Gets me a little bit. Yeah. No, me. that I, I I love it when I learn something about the <laughs> novel and I just learn something. Yeah. It's uh, it's uh, I think you I think you're dead on the money. Mm -hmm. it, that it's uh, uh, as as far as his shriveled little heart is capable of love he loves her but i don't know if if that mm -hmm. is you, you're right maybe maybe it's not uh, it doesn't come up to chalk up to proper love whatever that may be if you could pick three adjectives oh no that you think andrew breville would like people to think about him what would they be <laughs> oh i'm so bad at these sort of Games. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, self-made. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, because that's what's important to him. Aud audacious mm -hmm. uh, and 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 brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way he sees himself. He's a little exhausting that way. He is a little exhausting. <laughs> yes. He he really is. Yeah, he and needs to be. He really he, is. He has to be. He has to be. You know, his relationship with Ida, I found so interesting. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, and maybe it's, again, you sort of fall in the tropes. I thought, oh, gosh, is this going to end up being a romance? Right. You know, are, are we going there? He's, she's going to his home. We know yeah. what the time is like. Why does she feel comfortable going to his home? It must mean a lot to her to have this job for her to, That's the reason. to go to her, this home. Yes. Yeah, well, what was Ida's reason for, for being so... I guess willing to risk certain things for this job. <clears throat> yeah, I th I think uh, one reason. Th I think there are a number of reasons. One is simply she really needs the job. Her 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 father is uh, not very effective out in the in the real <laughs> world, and they they're, they it's the depression. They're broke. They yeah. need the money. As simple as that. And she needs to you know, face these. And also I think she, she feels confident enough about her own resources as a person, as a woman to, and, and she, I think the way I thought of her was always, okay, she, she thinks of herself as well armed for battle, you mm -hmm. know, intellectually, mm -hmm. intellectually. Uh, and, and I think she is like, I, th I think she had that happened. I think she would have had interesting tools and approaches to, to deal uh, with that circumstance, I also think she's she's curious, so she wants to see she wants to see more about this of this world mm -hmm. and learn more of, about this man, um, and um, and she's also ambitious, which is a good thing. It's not yeah. a, it's not a bad thing. She's also ambitious, so she 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 wants to affirm herself in this place and 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 and, and is fearless in ways that are unimaginable to me. <laughs> But she is fearless. I was so glad it wasn't a romance, by the way. I just want to put that oh, out there. No, just, also, thank you. I yes, appreciate no, that. And yeah, I think yeah. you're a more sophisticated person than that. So, <laughs> so I no, appreciate no, no. that. But, it, but it's, 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 it's there for, it's an expectation that I wanted sort of to uh, uh, frustrate. With. Yeah. Her dad is this, he's part of these anarchist movements. Yes. Um, <clears> why <throat> did you want to include this little part of history in this novel? Well, it's I, interesting. Yeah, well, I, 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 you know, I, the secretary and the word is in incredible, right? It's a keeper of secrets. Mm. And I took that very literally. Uh, the uh, secretary was a very important uh, presence in, in American life at that period. It was the way in which so many women entered the white collar labor force mm. and ascended socially without marrying into the middle class, for example. Um, that was very interesting to me, given the general topic of 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 the book, which revolves so much around gender and money. So uh, that, that was a, a crucial thing. I also knew that I wanted a contrast to this, to this world of extreme wealth. And that contrast was to be found on the other side of the East River in, in, in Brooklyn, uh, in Italian Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a natural choice because, you know, at that time, that was the largest migratory movement in human history mm -hmm. from, from Italy to the United States. Uh, I'm also half Italian, 
So that, that was also a way for me to engage with my own heritage. Mm -hmm. I mean, my family ended up in Argentina, but they could have just as easily ended up here. It's mm -hmm. just a fluke, I think. And, um, uh, and also, the, the more I looked into this, uh, 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 um, you know, I discovered that the history of uh, uh, anarchism in, in America has been completely erased. And look, I had, I had access to very deep archives. Mm -hmm. Uh, very serious archives, and not even there could I find complete collections of, of anarchist uh, journals and magazines, and uh, of which there were so many at the time. And this was, going back to the issue mm -hmm. of voice, this was also interesting to me. Though During those years in the United States, uh, the 20s and, and, and 30s, especially the 20s, there was a chance for, uh, you know, a left to come to... Uh, to, be, to become a reality in, in this country, moved to a large extent by, by Italian immigrants, and it was crushed with, the, with extreme violence, and it's mm. not something that is talked about to the extent that it should, I think. Why do you think Ida's father was not able to pass this ideology on to his daughter? Or why was she perhaps not as willing yeah. to be as engaged? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's just, and I... I'm a parent myself. I have mm -hmm. I have a, a preteen daughter, so you know, <laughs> it's 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 coming. The the the, the pushback is coming. You feel it, <laughs> yeah, as it sh as it should, as yeah. it should. And uh, I think a lot of it is that Ida is a young woman. He is uh, so strident in his opinions, mm -hmm. and it's it's a black and white world. There is no nuance. Mm. He's he can never be wrong. He's always right. It's, I mean. Who would be into that? <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah. There were a couple of small moments in that I just think about a lot in the novel, especially in the Ida section. I keep thinking about the butler, oh. not wanting to serve her. Jer he's a jerk. He's just a jerk, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't or know. is there more to that? Is no, it just, there's, no, there's no, there's nothing else to that. It was just I wanted a butler who was a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> and for, no, but also it's it's what I imagine too is, you know, of course a butler is is a working class person. Mm -hmm. Although you know they have all these airs and this kind of stiff protocol that they follow, but they're they're working people. Needless to say, uh, and it was interesting to me that 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 relationship become sort of antagonistic, that he would be uh, very hostile to the other working person, mm -hmm. woman mm -hmm. in, in, in the house, you know? And, and he, he feels that she maybe has some heirs because she, she has access to the big man. Yeah, know? there's also protocol to be followed. Yes, Partly yes, but it's, but it's very much a gender thing and this mm -hmm. internal weird class resentment that, that we see a lot, you know? And it's a th I think it's a thing. It is a thing. Yeah. And one of the other most memorable moments was, so Bevel takes one of Ida's stories from her own childhood oh, and, yeah. <laughs> and recreates it oh, man. as one of Mildred's yeah. memories. So what does this moment teach Ida about Bevel? And what does it teach us about Bevel? I, I think that that's... Thank you, by the way, for bringing up the butler. Nobody so far in <laughs> has mentioned the butler ever. It's the first time. Um, but the other moment you mention is, is very important in the book. Mm -hmm. It's very important because it's the moment where he, Bevel, has hijacked a, a personal childhood memory of Ida's that she has written into, because, again, mm -hmm. she's the ghostwriter, right? Yeah. So she has written that into the uh his his life into his memoir and he has accepted this narrative as true like now this is something it's very vamp vampiric if you know it's mm -hmm. very parasitical uh and it speaks to precisely what we we're talking about at the beginning the nature of narratives in relation to power and the issue of voice uh how i feel how all these great men and in quotes mm -hmm. always assume air quotes uh <laughs> ho how all these great men end up believing the stories told about themselves mm -hmm. and and 
now this has become the reality of their lives and it's all a fabrication, right? Um, I think it's also most likely a very male thing, like to hear something and then quote it back to, you know, uh, mm. as if as if it had been his idea all of a sudden, you know. And uh, it, it's so crazy when you're gasped it that way. And <laughs> so, I don't know. I just thought it was also, or another way I thought about it was, it's the ultimate privilege. I have taken what is yours and yes, mine. Yes, exactly. It is mine. Yes. I, I have, have paid for your presence. I have paid for all of this. I, and I have paid for your words. And now you have sold me the scene of your childhood or whatever it mm -hmm. is. And now it's mine. Throughout the novel, there are different ideas presented about what money and what mm -hmm. it means. In Bonds, he writes of Bevel's relationship. He viewed capital as an antiseptically living thing. It moves, eats, grows, breeds, falls, ill, may die, but it is clean. Bevel says, all of us aspire, or Bevel says, all of us aspire <laughs> to greater wealth because nothing in nature is stable. One cannot merely keep what one has. Hmm. Ida's father says, what is money? Commodities in a purely fantastic form. And Mildred says in her diaries, I was obsessed with the process. It would be dishonest to claim it was only an intellectual exercise for me. I discovered a deep well of ambition within. Yeah. What did you want to explore about what money means to different people? Um, well, I, I think you just really found the, the perfect spots. I, 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 I feel I will be paraphrasing the, the passages okay. you just read. Um, the, the, the thing about money, and, and hence in part the title of, of the book, is that it relies enormously on trust. Um, the, of course, the book, the, the, the word as a title has many other implications, mm -hmm. but this is just one of them. Um, and there's, there's absolutely nothing material that links, say, a $100 bill to the purchasing power that it has. It's... It's, you know, if you te take a step back, yeah. all money is monopoly money. There, there's nothing inherently valuable about, about that, except for the fact that we all trust this piece of paper to be legal tender, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this, and, and in this, money resembles language to a large extent, right? There is, it's, it's also a contract mm -hmm. um, uh, that relies on trust and convention and, uh, and, and, uh, and a strong sense of institutional belonging. Um, and this is what I was very interested in about money, how it is at, 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 at its core a fiction that we have all agreed to participate in, right? Of all these characters, who would believe in Bitcoin? I'm not entirely sure what Bitcoin is yet. <laughs> uh, I think it's this belief, like we've yeah, all decided something yeah. is worth something. But um, <laughs> but I think I think probably I think probably Andrew Bevel. I yeah. Think, yeah. He would he would be mining for crypto. <laughs> exactly. Keep going. I, I, I'm, I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> I interrupted but, but, you. Please but, continue. But the interesting thing about that is that already, like, if I had said that, not in total jest, you know, so much of this. Of, it is is hype mm -hmm. and is is narrative is how you talk about it and that's you know that's how it snowballs and I think that has been a part a guiding vector of markets since forever you know. What does Andrew Bevel see as his role in the culture? Does he really believe that he, his existence is important? to help Absolutely. keep he, the markets going, to yeah, keep the economy going. He, he believes, like he's a staunch fiscal conservative and, and a free market fanatic. Mm -hmm. And, and he, he believes he has taken on this sort of uh, vigilante almost quality of, yeah. you know, of even ha having to storm the market to defended from external forces like he's obviously against any form of regulation mm -hmm. he's against the federal reserve he's against you know uh other uh, uh, actors as they call them um so i think yeah i think i think he sees himself as the sort of the stalwart defender of of of, of the free market of, 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 of this of the spirit of, of 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 capitalism you know yeah i want to talk about mildred's diary you want to make sure we get to it 
before we take some more questions because we've been talking for a while. Um, so she's keeping a diary at the end of her life. And <laughs> my friend and I always have a saying, you don't write things down if you don't want someone to read it. <laughs> yeah, diaries are mysterious. They're mysterious. Yeah. Like these are my private thoughts, but I'm writing them down. <laughs> That's right. <Yeah. laughs> and someone might find them and t to read them. And sort of this idea that maybe deep down inside we all think or hope or ponder that someone will read it one day. Yeah. I mean, there is <clears throat> there's a line in there uh, that says more or less, uh, you know, a diarist is a monster. The, the writing hand and the reading eye are sourced from different bodies. Mm. Like the, the implication being the, the, the future self of, you know, the person who's writing the text, the mm. diary, is, won't be the same person, strictly speaking, because obviously time has gone by. Um, so, um, so this kind of uh, 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 monstrous quality or, mm -hmm. uh, of, 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 a, of, a, of a diary keeper has always been fascinating to me. I've always been unable to keep a journal because I'm too self-conscious. I, <laughs> I mean, I end up becoming like a, a character and it's, uh, it's not, I'm not, I'm never there in my, in my journals. I mean, the few times I've tried. Do you keep one? No. Yeah. No. 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 <laughs> no, was, no, no. That was a hard no. <laughs> hard yeah. no. Um, let's get to some of your, your questions. Uh, this is from Joel. Joel. Can you say more about the relationship between Mildred and Vanner? We have diary entries suggesting correspondence between them and a calendar ledgers that he visited the Bevel home. Is there more? Uh, there is a lot more. Thank you for the question. There is a lot more. There is a whole unwritten book of Vanner in my head. Yeah. Um, oh, wow. Uh, I, was, I was interested in, 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 um, uh, in having one of the central characters in the book, who's Harold Vanner, this mm -hmm. author, never appear in the book, and he doesn't. Uh, in in early versions, I, I had Ida maybe going out to meet him. Mm -hmm. He's an alcoholic who lives on Long Island someplace, and his life is has been destroyed by by Andrew Bevel. Uh, uh, but I left I left all of that out. I, I preferred I preferred him to be spectral mm -hmm. uh, in in the book. And there are other clues. I'm sort of hesitant. Maybe it's silly, but. I'm hesitant to give them away that th they're little kind mm -hmm. of Easter eggs about how they're connected. Um, um, uh, I don't, th I mean, they're not, they're not, again, they're not, they're not lovers. They were not lovers. Okay. They're, they're friends. Yeah. Let's see. We have, you touched on this a little bit, but I'll ask it directly. <clears throat> Why is the title trust? Well, the, the title is trust. I was just talking about m money and the trust mm -hmm. that goes into money. Then also, in the 20s and 30s, or and even before, trust was a close synonym, and it's, it's, it is today to some extent, of, of monopoly, mm -hmm. right? As in antitrust laws. Um, uh, and, and, and Bevel exerts a sort of, of, of financial monopoly. Um, um, so that, 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 was, that was an added uh, 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 semantic dimension to the title. And lastly, of course, the, the emotional side, the, exper the human experience of, of trust and confidence, mm -hmm. which has many different uh, 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 sides in the book. One being, well, can, which narrative will you, will you trust? Mm -hmm. uh, can you trust the voices that you hear, and 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 um, and 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 also, you know, what are the contracts that we enter into when we read? What kind of trust do we place in text, in general, and what is the relationship between that trust and the power that narratives have over the real world? Because I believe they do. S Tree story time on Instagram. Was, What's your favorite fiction book? What's my favorite <laughs> fiction book? Ooh, I, I don't have one. I can name a few. Uh, I think Middlemarch is by George Eliot is, is, is one of my favorites. Now I'm reading her last novel, Daniel Deronda, and I'm loving it. Uh, I love Moby Dick. Um, um, I love almost every book written by David Markson. Uh, I love almost every book written by Joy Williams. Um, I, I can go on for a long time. <laughs> yeah. I think you gave somebody a nice, a nice summer reading list. Uh, 
Why was Mildred so dismissive about music that was, quote, predictable? She used her math skills to predict the direction of the market, so she seems to value predictability. I'm sorry, why was Mildred so dismissive of music? music that was predictable. Oh, oh, um, oh, I see where this is going. Yeah, I, because she talks about the, that's, that's motivated by, in her journal, by a, by a quote by Jean Riss, also mm -hmm. a favorite writer of mine, since we're talking about mm -hmm. favorite writers, uh, where she talks about Puccini and this music that you know exactly where it's going. And, and then she, Mildred, talks about sort of the classical form and this idea, you know, between tension and resolution and how, you know, uh, the this, this seed of, of, of a musical arc already tells you what, what the mm -hmm. fate of that arc will be. Um, I, don't, it, I don't know if dismissive is the word that I would choose. I think she's critical of it. Okay. And it has to do with her, this moment in history. Like, this la last part of the book, the personal diary is a sort of an ode to again the literature that i love which is you know high high modernist art and mm -hmm. literature so the other composers that she is talking about like you know uh, alban berg uh, whose manuscript she buys in 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 mm -hmm. that uh she talks a lot about schoenberg um i think she talks about webern um uh, uh and so on and so forth this is kind of the 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 stuff that she's into, yeah. sort of this this uh, 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 more modern, dissonant, uh, serial uh, kind of music. So she views the music of the past, perhaps with some disdain, maybe. What kind of research did you do to make the musical choices? Um, I, I followed two paths. One is just my, my I happen to like all that music mm -hmm. as well, so it was easy just to give her my my uh, my my own taste. <laughs> uh, that was one thing. The other thing that I um, try to focus on was um, the the place that that women again were assigned in the musical scene of the time, mm -hmm. which was usually had to do with patronage and philanthropy, and the few women composers, American women composers, you know, remained to a large extent, like Mary Howe and or. Uh, uh, Ruth Crawford Seeger, uh, you know, they they remain uh, pretty much unrecorded and not very much, uh, you know, they're not part of the repertoire to the extent that I think they should be. So, yeah. So we're going to end on the music note so we can make a nice segue to Shana Let's Taub in just it, a yeah. moment. First, I want to say thank you so much for all the time you. you've oh. given us. It was such a pleasure to speak with you early thank in the month. It was a pleasure me. to speak oh. to you now. Now I have to go back and reread it again because you blew my mind <laughs> halfway through the interview. Um, everybody, thank you so much, Erin. A we true really honor. Thank you so you much. There. Thank you. So, so we finished talking about female composers. Well, I write my, on my face. Shana Taub is the creator of the just-completed hip off-Broadway musical Suffs, which, like Trust, takes place in the early decades of the 20th century. Looking ahead, Shana is doing the musical adaptation of Shakespeare's As You Like It. will be part of Shakespeare in the Park this summer, as well as the Devil Wears Prada musical from Taub. She's working with, oh, Elton John. Uh, that's going to premiere in Chicago in July. She has a solo album out, so we are so happy that she has found some time to play a few songs for us tonight. The new album is called Songs of the Great Hill. Let's welcome Shana. Shana, what are you going to play? Hi, it's so nice to be here. I'm so excited to read this amazing <laughs> book. That was the best preview. Um, yeah, this is a song for the record called The Least. You're always on Twitter You're never on time The sound of your snoring Could be considered a crime But out of everyone I've ever met Honey I hate you the least, honey, I hate you the least, the people I come across rub me the wrong way, they've either got much too much or much too little to say, still out of everyone I've ever met, honey, I hate you the least. Honey, I hate you the least And I know I can be a pain in the ass I leave my dirty laundry all over the floor I'm impatient 
Stains and stubborn as anything, but still I hope you hate everybody else a little more. Cause honey, without you, I would be toast. You're last on my shit list. That's why I love you the most. So out of everyone I've ever met, honey, I hate you the least. Honey, I hate you the least. Honey, I hate you. Honey, I hate you. Honey, I hate you the least. I can't wait to try that line out on someone. <laughs> sure, yeah, totally. <laughs> I hope I have the opportunity to. First of all, Suffs just wrapped. How does yeah. it feel? That was such, first of all, it was incredible. Oh, thank incredible you so much. Incredible show. How did thank it feel you. once you got to the end of the run? Well, you know, we had a lot of incredible, amazing highs at the show and amazing visitors and activists mm -hmm. and Hillary Clinton came and all these magical moments. And then we also had a lot of hard times. We got shut down from COVID twice. So I think we were all just felt such triumph to get to come back and finish our run after a two week pause and get to do six more shows and have so many of our fans come back and just sort of the whole story is about prevailing over all these hardships. And so it really felt like our own journey with the show mirrored that. So I think, yeah, I'm feeling like relief that we got to finish the run and very grateful. Will we see it again someplace else? We're all working on it. I mean, I'm very yeah. lucky that I have incredible producers and we have a lot of amazing people who've shown interest in supporting us and the next steps. And I, I'm not done. So, I mean, I'm excited to hopefully fulfill the dream of bringing the show to more audiences. Yeah. When you were working on stuff, since we were talking about women composers of this period, how interested were you in the music of this period as you were starting to, to write the song so that they, they felt authentic? I was more interested than I thought. I think initially I thought, oh, I'll do kind of a contemporary pop rock score and do sort of this stylistic genre mashup that a lot of musicals have done, like something like Spring Awakening, 19th mm -hmm. century Germany, but indie rock of the early odds. But then the more I got into it, I was like, oh, this is sort of the birthplace of so many musical traditions that musical theater comes from. Early Broadway, the early Ziegfeld mm -hmm. Follies, Tim Alley, jazz. And also there's the whole songbook of incredible uh, ragtime era misogynistic <laughs> mm -hmm. tunes, ditties, you know, that I thought <laughs> if I could sort of like reclaim those and write my own version of some of those and really play with the sound of the time being the sound of the culture that these women were up against. Aaron mm -hmm. was talking about all the research he was able to do at the New York Public Library. I'm curious about what your research was into Alice Paul. What was your process? How much did you decide that you wanted this to be autobiographical? How much of it needed to have creative license? Yeah, I dove deep into the research early on. I started sort of my, I call my gateway drug book into the suffrage movement was Jailed for Freedom by Doris mm -hmm. Stevens, who's a character in the musical. And that just led me down this rabbit hole of, uh, I went to the Schlesinger Library at the Radcliffe Institute, which is, yeah, Best place eyes. ever. It's amazing. Best place ever. I got to do a month-long <laughs> research fellowship there. Wow. And it, that was my first real diving into the topic after I finished the Shakespeare in the Park show. And that, re that research fellowship was a month long, and it started in mid-October to mid-November 2016. So that was a really intense oh, wow. month to be there, you know, and diving into the Alice Paul papers and uh, reading Carrie Chapman Katz papers of NASA and the NWP, National Women's Party, mm -hmm. and all these primary sources, and then diving into incredible secondary sources of Paula Giddings' biography of Ida B. Wells. And really, for, it was the first research-based project I've done, so really reading 10 different accounts of sort of the same event. And I think the whole process of writing the show has been giving myself permission to have that creative license, as you said, to... I feel this sort of responsibility to, quote, get them right, these women, because mm -hmm. they haven't been dramatized that much. But it's been trying to sort of free myself from that sense of responsibility of, in order to make a compelling piece of drama, you have to care about these women emotionally and the things that they were thinking, you know, in their diaries. So does yeah. you were just talking about diaries. I'm not going to find that in the research, especially with my main character, Alice Paul, who was personally very elusive. She did not write a diary. <laughs> you know, she really left that... Yeah. Blank. So it's just been sort of giving myself permission to create her as I imagine her to have been. I remember working on when I was working on my book, and I was looking at the papers of one of Mary Church Terrell's students. 
oh, all of her papers were in the Schlesinger Library wow. because yeah. she was then went on to be the professor of Ed Brooke, who was the first black senator. Uh -huh. And she was, Charles Hamilton Houston was her lawyer. And it's just reading them in real time as they are experiencing their life yeah. is fascinating. There's just, I mean, you really get lost. I got lost. Yeah. Absolutely, I, I had to really step away. It would be like, step away from the research, mm -hmm. you know, just because I could just live in it forever, you know, and, and yeah, there's just such a treasure show, so much more than my two and a half hour musical could ever encompass. <laughs> what is a way that you wanted to frame the suffrage movement that it hadn't been explored before? Because to your point, a lot of these women had not been written about before, mm. and just the idea of it being a suffrage as opposed to suffragette movement, you know, that's Absolutely. that's very interesting to me too. Well, right, of course, the word that we remember is the word that was the diminutive term for them, suffragette, and that was the one that I had known. Of course, they called themselves suffragists and also mm -hmm. suffs, which I sort of chose as the moniker because I like that, that they sort of yeah. claimed that as their own. For me, I mean, as a dramatist, I'm looking for the conflict. And it sort of felt like the obvious conflict in a lot of the books I was reading was, of course, about the suffragists and all the forces against them, the Wilson administration, the general national culture and mood and point of view, which would thought the idea of women voting was absolutely ridiculous. But I, I just felt like an audience might be ahead of that. And mm -hmm. I didn't want to be like, oh, I'm going to go see this musical about how women were amazing and noble and on the right side of history and all the baddies against them. And then they win. And I just, I didn't <laughs> want it to be like this simple liberal exercise and patting ourselves on the back. And so was, I was much more interested in is the uh, conflicts within the movement itself and how those manifest along, often not always, but along generational lines of an older generation that's been in the movement for longer and they're, okay, well, let's be a little more moderate. Let's play the game of politics. Let's develop relationships. Let's build alliances strategically, mm -hmm. you know, in the inside game versus often a younger generation that's, let's storm the gates now, radical action amendment, you know, like burn it down. And the way that those tactics both clash and work in unwitting harmony and you kind of see them manifest in every social movement in this country. So Everyone. I was like, exactly. So that felt really rich to me. I, early on, I found a quote by Susan B. Anthony that was really grounding for me, where she said, there was never a young woman yet who didn't think that if only she had had the management of the work from the start, the cause would have been carried long ago. I felt just so when I was young. And I was like, that feeling, whether you're in social movements or not, I mean, you know, I'm in my early 30s, and it's sort of, I like to think of myself, oh, I'm the young generation at the gates, but, you know, there's some 22-year-olds in my cast, and I'm like, wait, I'm, you're... <laughs> I, I'm not the youngest one. You know, it's yes. sort of that moment we all have at different stages in our life and how that cycle, in order for activism, for these fights for liberty to be one, it needs to keep continuing and continuing. How did you record an album in the middle of all of this? Well, I mean, with the incredible support of Atlantic Records helping it happen in a pandemic for one. But oh my for me, it was that, you know, Suffs was supposed to happen in the fall of 2020. And of course, that wasn't meant to be. And I just felt so, I don't know, creatively I'm trying to think of a metaphor that's not disgusting. I just felt very like oh, ready to burst. And um, I had to, I just had to stay creatively sane and alive. And I was like, well, I've been working on these long form dramatic arcs that are so great, but so challenging. And I just want to write a song again. So I was like, I just going to sit at the piano every day. And just like that, just like write, just write it, have a, I had that simple idea. Just let me write a simple little song that isn't beholden to any larger piece. And I think that that was just sort of like a healing property for me throughout the pandemic. Where did you get inspiration during the pandemic about what to write when you were sitting in your apartment? <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, it was such a fraught time when I really yeah. started to s do this project around August 2020 in those months leading up to the election. So I would, it was, you know, a combination of sort of reading the news on my phone every day and writing a lot about that, but then also trying to put the phone away mm -hmm. and write about something that was on my mind that in a faster paced, normal uh, chapter of life, I could maybe bury deep inside, but, you know, we were all sort of just faced with ourselves. So I think it was sort of that combo of, going really inward and then also trying to make sense of the insanity that was the world at that time. And then let's talk about a couple of your other projects. This summer, Shakespeare in the Park. Tell us what we can expect. Yeah, so Shakespeare in the Park, I've done a lot of work with them. The Public Theater has this amazing initiative called Public Works that's a community-based program where they partner with eight organizations from all throughout the city that work with different communities. And they, it, it, we, it, there's so much to say about it. I mean, it, it's now in its 10th year, but uh, the program hasn't been able to gather for three summers now. And so this is a production of As You Like It, this musical adaptation I did with Lori Woolery, the director, uh, that we did in 2017. And we only got to perform three and a half times. I say three and a half times because one performance got cut off because of rain. Of rain. Anyone <laughs> who's been in the Delacorte Theater <laughs> understands that particular torture. Um, but 
it, we never we never got to do like a full celebratory run of it. And now that our adaptation has been done 50 times around the world in schools and communities. So we're excited to have sort of like a homecoming uh, run of, of that show. That's all about communities sort of prevailing over a really difficult situation. So it feels, it felt really apt in 2017. I'm interested to see like what it has to say in 2022. And I've just finished reading the Anna Wintour biography. Oh, yeah, I've got to pick that up. The biography. <laughs> <Yeah>. that's, <laughs> I'm very curious about The Devil Wears Prada. It's going to open in Chicago, yes. is that right? Yes, uh-huh. What was that process like for you? Because you've been doing your own thing, and this is a, this is a much bigger collaborative... Yes. <laughs> bohemian experience. <laughs> experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. I mean, well, first, it was just the writing with Elton John, Sir Elton. It, you know, usually I write music and lyrics myself, mm -hmm. but I was really excited by the prospect of writing words only and seeing what that was like. And with Elton, he's always worked lyrics first his whole career, over 50 years of collaboration with Bernie Taupin. It's, he gets a sheet and sits at the piano and goes on impulse with what comes out. So that the fact that he works that way really appealed to me because with theater, a song has to do so much heavy lifting in terms mm -hmm. of story and character. I get to sit and work on it for weeks of just words and you know, like kind of just sort of create it, get it on the sheet as clear a story as possible. So then when I can go to the studio with him and he puts it in front of the piano, I've like hopefully set up the best like ingredients for the meal to be made. So that, I mean, it's just been a total thrill and honor in every way. And then, I mean, in some ways, superficially, it might seem like these two musicals are very different, but they both have a really similar central relationship, mm -hmm. talking about like the intergenerational conflict about yeah. how to achieve a goal or, you know, power and ambition among women and, you know, it's what is that book was written at the turn of the millennium. The movie came out in 2006. Now it's 2022 in a much different moment. Like what is I think the movie we're also obsessed with, you know, the mythology of Anna Wintour and of Miranda Priestly and Meryl Streep and every iteration of that. And while that character is phenomenal and I'm hoping that we'll delight people with what we're trying to mm -hmm. do with it. The, it's really Andy's story. It's the story of a 23 year old ambitious young writer trying to make it in New York, you know, and it's yeah. really I, I'm excited by the opportunity to kind of. Uh, flesh out that character more deeply. And her boyfriend really is the bad guy. It's well, not Miranda Priestly. Well, just you wait. This is a big, I mean, <laughs> justice for Nate. We're trying to like redeem, <laughs> redeem this boyfriend, but also hopefully the, present something more complex of those like relationships in your early 20s when you're having, you're not dealing with school and parents anymore. You're dealing with career and relationship and how you start to balance those things. So I'm, I'm hoping we, I, I'm hoping, yeah, you can do like a poll and it's 50-50 <laughs> like he like, he said, you know, that if we do our job right, hopefully it's there's more nuance, I hope. Do you rest? Do you, <laughs> do you rest? I mean, we just talked about four amazing projects. Well, for me, it's they all were waiting for the pandemic. All in the pandemic, I've been waiting for this. The like pent this, up. There was like a lot yeah, of... Yeah, so I'm so energized. I'm like so grateful that I had, you know, it's, it's a tough business and that I have projects that I'm passionate about that are my job, that I love. I feel like it, it energizes you in a different way. It's yeah. Does it happen in waves like that? Because, you know, like you said, you're in your 30s. You've mm -hmm. been working for a while. And then it just seems like these past two years, it has been nonstop for you. Is, is that, has that been your experience that you have, mm -hmm. uh, you know, valleys and peaks, ebbs and flows? Yeah. But, but it, to me, like the grounding forces have just been like discipline and community. I think early on oh. I was like, if I'm really going to write before anyone's paying me to do it, before anyone's listening. If I don't figure out my own practice, like I read Twyla Tharp's book, The Creative Habit, early on, and that was really, it, I think, defining for me to find my community of artists who we were all cheering each other on and writing stuff in our living rooms before anyone was paying us to do it. You know, and so I think the, the stages have gotten bigger, the support and the resources have gotten bigger, which is incredible, but that, it feels like I've always been doing it. It's just now I have a bigger platform. Will you play another song for us? Sure. Yeah, what are yeah, we going to yeah. play? I'm going to play a song from the record called, Sh well, it's funny. Should I give away the title before I play it? Maybe I won't. Okay. Because <laughs> it's one of those songs that like, I think I might not have written if I didn't just, if I wasn't just staring my own soul in the face every day All <laughs> in right. lockdown. Okay. Go for it. This is Shana Taub. a kid Would it be the greatest or the stupidest thing I ever did Would my world expand or shrink Would my heart explode or sink 
Is motherhood a blessing or a trap? I don't know what to think. Should I, should I, should I, should I have a kid? Would it blow my mind or make me blow my lid? I like my work, I like my house, I like my body, I like my spouse. Would a baby burn them all down in flames? I might never be able to douse. Would it be my miracle or my mistake? Would I repeat my parents' patterns that I've tried so hard to break? Am I ready? Will I ever be? Could I become as committed a mom as my mom was to me? Something awful happens to them God forbid I'm so scared of what I'd lose But is fear a poor excuse? Will the grass grow ever greener On whichever side I do not choose? Should I, should I, should I should I, 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 should I? So great. Thank you so much to Shana Taub. But also thank you to Steinway for the piano. And thank you to Aaron Diaz for joining us for this evening. We're going to announce our June Get Lit selection in a moment, but I need to do thank yous because we're polite around here. We want to thank our partners, the New York Public Library, Tony Marks, Brian Bannon, and Michael Stent. Angelo, they help get those books, those e-copies to you every month. Also, our Green Space partners, Jennifer Ricardo, Amber Chase, and thanks to the Get Lit producers, Megan Ryan, Jordan Loff, and Simon Close. Okay, I think we have the slide for our June selection. We're going to be reading an exciting debut novel from a talented emerging author. We're reading Post Traumatic by Chantal V. Johnson. The novel tells the story of a young lawyer of color who advocates for patients at a psychiatric hospital here in New York, but soon her work starts to take a toll and forces her to confront some past traumas of her own. Thanks to our partners at NYPL, you can check out New Yorkers. You can check out an e-copy of the book. They have unlimited licenses by heading to wnyc.org slash get lit. Definitely follow us on Instagram. That's where we hold our book club in between the live events. That's at all of it, WNYC. I'm Allison Stewart. I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us and happy reading. <laughs>